Hello, this is online lecture number 18. This week we will start with a new topic. We discuss chemical reactions. But first, what did we do last week? We discussed the stability of reactive intermediates. And we learned that this stability can um, be controlled by either electronic effects or via steric effects. An example of electronic effects are inductive effects. There is a negative inductive effect that is based on um, electronegativity differences in the atoms of a molecule. And um, in, for the negative inductive effect, you have stabilization of carboanions. There's a positive inductive effect that stabilizes carbocations. There's hyperconjugation, and that usually works together with the plus inductive effect, where there are additional um, sp3 molecules stabilizing the uh, carbocation. Then we discussed positive, uh, mesomeric effects. So this is the positive mesomeric effect, where a lone pair donates an electron um, to form a pi bond and that leads to delocalization and delocalization lowers the energy and stabilizes reactive intermediates. There's also a mes negative mesomeric effect. But then next to electronic effects, there are steric effects where just the bulky volume physically blocks access to the reactive site, in this case, the um, radical carbon in the middle. So in this new week, we start with a new topic, chemical reactions. So let's first make some definitions. Nucleophiles and electrophiles. So a nucleophile, for instance, an uh, anionic molecule is an electron donor. It can donate electrons to an electrophile, which is an electron acceptor. And the uh, curly arrow indicates the movement of this pair of electrons now to form a sigma bond between A and B, a covalent bond resulting in a neutral molecule. But a nucleophile doesn't have to be a, a ionic uh, molecule. It can also be a molecule with a lone pair of electrons. And then the curly arrow shows it can attack a, an electrophile and the product that forms um, is then also a positively charged uh, molecule because the electrophile is positively charged and therefore the entire charge of the product is preserved. There are as many new electrons and protons in the product as there were in the reactants. So it's relatively easy to identify anionic nucleophiles like hydroxide or cyanide but also neutral nucleophiles exist, and those are often molecules with lone pairs, as I already mentioned, so they can donate electron density to form a new bond, but also pi bonds um, can act as nucleophilic sites because of the high electron density that they have, donating electrons. And also a polarized molecule like this, where you have a partial negative charge on the carbon due to the less electronegative lithium, so now the carbon can act as a um, nucleophile. So electrophiles are also um, different types. So for instance, here you have um, a partial positive charge on the carbon due to the more electronegative chlorine. And the chlorine can often split off with the electron from the carbon to form a chloride. And then you get a carbocation that can then be the, the electrophile. And also a ketone, where you have a more electronegative oxygen withdrawing electron density from the carbon, causing this to become a nuclear electrophile. So let's look at some examples of reactions. Here is an amine and a chlorocarbon. Let's identify what is the electrophile first. The electrophile is on the last side shown, positively charged carbon, partially negatively charged chloride. This causes even the chloride to break off, forming a chloride anion, leaving a po positive charge on the carbon. So this is our electrophile. It's hungry for electrons. Now, the nitrogen has a lone pair, and that lone pair is able to donate electron density. And the curly arrow shows now the electron density is donated to the positively charged carbon, forming a positively charged nitrogen since the electron is gone and a chloride ion that splits off from the molecule. Here is another example. We have this lithium compound and a ketone. So now the partial positive charge is on the carbon because of the electron withdrawing of the oxygen. So this is our electrophile. And because of the partial negative charge on the carbon here, due to the less electronegative lithium, this is then our nucleophile. So the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic site, 
leading to the formation of this product where there's a negative charge on the oxygen since the, lone, uh, since the pi bond has formed a lone pair on the oxygen now. And the nucleophilic attack has caused the lithium to split off as a lithium cation. So usually, this is a generic statement, chemical reactions, they always involve interactions between filled and empty orbitals of reactants and products. So here's uh, schematically depicted the energy levels of a filled and an empty orbital. And these two now can react to form new molecular orbitals. And you can see since the electrons from the filled orbital jumped to this lower energy level, there's a reduction in the energy after the reaction. So this is a reaction that can take place. But if for example, now there are two filled orbitals of reactants, A and reactant B, then okay, these electrons can jump to the lower energy level, but then these electrons have to jump to the higher energy level. So the decrease in energy is compensated by the increase in energy, and therefore there's no net energy reduction. So this is not a reaction that takes place. Of course, also, if there are no electrons at all in the reactant uh, orbitals, then there is no energy reduction because no electrons can anyway go to any lower energy level. So only this last example, example C, um, is the one that leads to a lowering of the energy and therefore to a reaction. But there's one more point that I would like to make. Only orbitals with similar energies actually interact. So here's an example of that. These are two orbitals of reactants that have, they have the same energy and now, if, they, if electrons would jump to lower molecular orbital energies, this arrow indicates the reduction of the energy. And now, if the orbitals here become more dissimilar in their energies, then this arrow becomes shorter and shorter, and therefore the reaction is, is less energetically favorable. And in the extreme case, um, the energy level of the two reactants are completely different, so that causes there to be a zero energy reduction, um, and therefore there's no tendency for this reaction to happen at all. So you see, the principle that is important is to notify that it's more favorable for, uh, for reactant orbitals to interact with each other when they have more similar energies. So let's look at... So let me make another definition. Have you heard of the highest occupied molecular orbital, abbreviated as HOMO, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, abbreviated as LUMO? So this is an example of a molecule. It has different um, uh, orbitals at different energy levels, and these orbitals can either be filled with pairs of electrons or they can be empty. So this is molecule A, this is molecule B. Again, it has filled and empty orbitals. The orbitals of B are slightly different than A since it's a different uh, molecule and therefore it has different energies. So now remember, um, what, what does that mean? Highest occupied molecular orbital. So this is the, the orbital that has the highest energy level of all the orbitals that are filled. And you see there are two arrows indicating two spin paired electrons. So this is the HOMO of A and this is the HOMO of B, of course. So the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is above the HOMO, is the next one. So it has the lowest energy of all the unoccupied orbitals and is abbreviated as LUMO and in this case of molecule A. And here LUMO is uh, above the HOMO of B. So the lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital, the one down here. So remember this rule here, molecules interact if their um, orbitals are um, of similar energies. So and also the second thing we've learned, empty and filled orbitals react with each other. So that means usually that for a reaction to take place, it is usually between a LUMO and a HOMO, right? because the LUMO is empty and the HOMO is filled. But now the most favorable interaction is um, for the two, for the HOMO-LUMO pair that has the most similar energy interaction. So you see, for instance, in, in this example of A and B here, 
it's the HOMO A and LUMO B that are most close in energy to each other and they can interact with each other to form a new molecular orbital which causes the lowest energy um, to be obtained. Unlike this combination that's more different in energy, so LUMO A and HOMO B here are not interacting. It's HOMO A and LUMO B that interact with each other. So let's look at an example of an interaction between a HOMO and a LUMO. It's a nucleophilic addition reaction and here's the reaction equation. We have a negatively charged hydrogen, also known as hydride, and this um, ketone that is uh, methanol. So you can see easily the nucleophile in this reaction must be the hydride because it has a lone pair of electrons and the electrophile is uh, positively charged um, carbon here due to the electron withdrawing of the oxygen. So you see the product is a negatively charged um, a molecule. So for the reaction to take place, first um, the hydride and the methanol need to meet, they need to find each other, and that is facilitated because of the electrostatic attraction between the negative charge of the hydride and the partial positive charge of the carbon. And then electron density is transferred from the hydride to the oxygen within the reaction, and that makes sense since oxygen has a higher electronegativity and um, therefore it's um, energetically favorable to concentrate the negative charge around the oxygen rather than the hydride. So here is um, the 1s orbital of the hydride. Um, that is the highest occupied molecular orbital. It has a lone pair of electrons and now you have to find the uh, LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital from the methanol. So there are a lot of occupied orbitals like these uh, CH bonds here or the sigma bit bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And then the highest um, occupied molecular orbital in the methanol is the pi bond, right? It has a higher energy than the sigma bond. But it's an occupied uh, orbital, so it's not a LUMO. We're looking for a LUMO. So the LUMO of um, the methanol is the anti-bonding pi bond. Remember, each time um, a molecular orbital forms, there's a bonding and an anti-bonding uh, molecular orbital. And um, since um, the pi bond is the highest orbital, um, uh, filled orbital um, in, in energy, the, the next highest uh, uh, orbital is the anti-bonding pi bond and that we call the, the pi star. So the carbonyl pi star, the anti-bonding pi bond. So that is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the methanol. And um, as uh, you remember from the last slide, the interaction now takes place between the HOMO and the LUMO. And here is a computer simulation or the, a, a picture from the beginning of a computer simulation where there is the hydride HOMO, the 1s orbital, and then the methanol LUMO, the pi star, which as you can see has a nodal plane here and it has negative and positive um, um, wave functions uh, given by the different shadings in this uh, surface plots. And now the Pi star, uh, the LUMO, and the 1s, the HOMO, um, react to form two new molecular orbitals um, and the electrons from the HOMO in the hydride, they jump into the uh, new molecular orbital which corresponds to the lone pair of electrons um, on the oxygen, right? So here is... Um, um, uh, the com full computer simulation. This is an intermediate state and you see the, the hydride begins to connect um, to the methanol and you see how it shrinks. Its, its electron density is basically sucked up by the, the lone pair of the oxygen and at the end the electron density is mostly concentrated around the lone pair of the oxygen here um, causing this reduction in energy. So now, we, we've seen how the hydride transfers its electron um, density to the oxygen, but if you look at the reaction equation, something is missing. 
because not only did the electron density move, but also a bond was broken here, namely the pi bond. Right? This whole reaction caused the pi bond to be broken. So how is that possible? So now looking at this additional um, process in this reaction, where we have an, the pi orbital of the, of the carbonyl uh, that is broken. So there are two electrons in this pi bond. And you see here the computer simulation, again, the 1s orbital, the one up here from the hydride. And here is the, the pi um, orbital between the carbon and the oxygen. And now in the reaction, you see how the electron density um, is shifting um, um, during the course of the reaction. And essentially at the end, um, there's from the pi original pi bond, more of the electron density is now concentrated around um, the, um, um, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. So energetically, you can describe it like this. The, the, the two electrons um, from the carbonyl bond, from the pi bond, they interact with this now empty orbital from the hydride. So this is, you could say, the, the HOMO and this is the LUMO. And they now form a new CH bond, right? This is what connects the hydrogen, the, the hydride to the carbon, right? The electron from the, from the hydride has formed a lone pair at the oxygen, but then the electron from the pi bond has connected the hydrogen to the carbon. Interesting, no? So we can also describe this process with the um, curly arrow notation. Um, but how we draw it with the curly arrow is that the hydride is the nucleophile. It attacks the, the carbon, the electrophile. This causes the electrons from the pi bond to actually jump over to the oxygen, forming the lone pair. And then the electron from the hydride forms together with the um, other electron from the pi bond, uh, a sigma bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. So isn't that weird? With the curly arrow notation, we say that the electron um, on the oxygen, actually it comes from the double bond. No, that's what this curly arrow says. But the computer simulation is this one down here. It has suggested that the negative charge on the lone pair of the oxygen, it actually came from the hydride. So these are two conflicting um, views. No. Um, but in fact, you cannot really say where the electron at the oxygen comes from, whether it comes from the hydride or whether it comes from the, from the, from the pi uh, bond. This is because of quantum mechanical reasons and of delocalization. So it's not clear, but at the end, what matters is that the outcome, the product molecule, is the same in both the computer simulation and in, uh, with our curly arrow notation. Complicated, no? So when you then have uh, this intermediate carb anion um, with a negatively char charged oxygen, it can now react with uh, a proton um, from an acid. So you could now to this uh, carb anion, you could add acid, such as hydrochloric acid, for instance, that produces protons. And then the reaction produces an alcohol, basically. Right. So now the um, uh, electrophile is the, 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 the proton and the nucleophile is the, is the um, carb anion and they produce uh, uh, an alcohol. So the HOMO is then the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen and the, the LUMO is the 1s orbital of the hydride. So this was a, a kind of an explanation of, of how a chemical reaction proceeds. And um, with this, we're at the end of this online lecture. It's think it over. It's fairly complicated, I think, how much involvement there is. But important to memorize is HOMO and LUMO interactions. They are the ones that that's, uh, facilitate chemical reactions. See you later.